Hey students, today we're going to be talking about the kingdoms of Spain and Portugal, specifically looking at the age of exploration that is beginning throughout uh, Europe. Now, in so many ways, the age of exploration begins with Marco Polo. Uh, when we think about Marco Polo, he traveled from Italy all the way over to Beijing to meet with the Great Khan. And the Great Khan right, in Beijing gave him so many resources, he became super wealthy. And what people began to realize is that the age of exploration was at foot, that people wanted to travel, people wanted to go all over the world, explore the world to see what there was out in the wide, wide world. What does the rest of the world have to offer? In so many ways during the Middle Ages, people didn't even really think about what was outside of them. They thought more so about where they were, right? They were dealing with things like the bubonic plague. They were dealing with things that were more internal because feudalism caused them to think more internally. But towards the end of the Middle Ages in the 14 and 1500s, we see that they desired more and more, the world did, especially after the bubonic plague, to go and explore. And for many kingdoms, the goal was to get wealthy through exploration. And Marco Polo really paved that path for them. Now, what you're looking at right now uh, is a beautiful wedding day portrait of Ferdinand, oh yeah, Ferdinand and Isabella. That's right. Now, Isabella, okay, is uh, the queen and Ferdinand is the king. Remember, they joined together. Isabella, uh, his brother was like, hey, you've got to marry somebody, like whether it's the king of Portugal or it's Pedro uh, Geron, uh, whoever it might be, you've got to marry somebody. And she was like, well, I really don't want to marry the king of Portugal. And I certainly don't want to marry Pedro Geron because remember Pedro Geron, he was uh, a scoundrel and he was always caught up in drinking and quarreling and killing and all that. So none of the matches that Isabella's brother uh, put uh, was trying to get Isabella matched with worked at all because Isabella didn't want to be married to somebody way older than her who didn't treat her with respect and care because uh, she's a woman and she needs to be cared for with respect and love and admiration and absolutely be cared for in a respectful way. But she right, decided to sort of take matters in her own hands. Uh, and so she begged her brother to change his mind, but her brother would refuse to change his mind. Um, and we even heard the the very interesting story about when she was supposed to get married to Pedro Guerron. Remember Pedro Guerron after Isabella prayed that she would not have to get married. In fact, Pedro Guerron, I think it was the day of, of their wedding, uh, actually died. So some interesting things happening for sure. Divine intervention, maybe, I don't know. But when we think about Isabel and Ferdinand, the key thing I want you to remember uh, beyond just the stories about Isabella getting married, remember she ends up marrying Ferdinand and uh, Ferdinand agrees. And so uh, essentially, okay, Ferdinand and Isabella, they have a flourishing marriage, of course, but not only that, they are really, really fantastic at ruling their kingdoms. And so not only do they rule their kingdoms really well, but they are very interested in this idea of the age of exploration. And so we begin to see the age of exploration take place. And this age of exploration was about going around and exploring the uncharted waters, going and exploring uncharted territories, places people had never been before, at least known to have been before. And one of the main ways that this age of exploration began was actually with the kingdoms of Spain and Portugal. In fact, we were going to talk about Henry the Navigator today, uh, who was a prince in Portugal, who was a key figure in the age of exploration. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what the age of exploration was all about. Well, I already told you, it's about going out and sharing, uh, or excuse me, going out and seeing all sorts of different new areas, new places, new resources, trying to expand countries, grow and learn. And so the age of exploration really, really took place as a result of this boat that you see 
right here. And you might be wondering, what in the world is this boat? Well, this is called a caravel, okay, a caravel. And a caravel essentially was a book uh, was was a boat that Portugal began to introduce. So when we think about the caravel, we're thinking about Portugal, okay, and we're thinking specifically about the Prince uh, Henry, who we call Henry the Navigator. Well, why was he called Henry the Navigator? Well, remember, people oftentimes had uh, a very descriptive uh, word or phrase, maybe their job or whatever at the end of their name to, sh to, to basically show who they were, why they were famous, that sort of thing. And Henry was known as the Navigator. Um, and so this particular boat, the Caravel, was new to the waters. And the reason why it was new is because before then, they had actually used other sorts of ships um, instead of of these caravels, they were using galleys, which we'll look at in just a second. But essentially, the caravel was supposed to be super fast, okay? That was the goal behind the caravel, okay? So the caravel has some different qualities, right? It's small, and indeed it was, right? All right, it's light, okay? It's maneuverable. Okay, meaning that it can kind of work through even shallow waters to some degree. Um, and it was able to gain very, very good seat, speed, okay? So big speed. So these boats were sort of perfect for the age of exploration because they could get to different places quick and they were very, very helpful. They were maneuverable. No matter what they could come across, they were maneuverable, they were small and they were light. So. One of the things that you'll notice about this caravel that I thought was really, really interesting, I'm actually going to um, uh, draw uh, on this figure here. I want to I point out to you, uh, over here, you'll actually notice that there's a place where, where it looks like you can sort of go inside the boat. Um, and this was actually often where the captain would be. And the captain had his quarters there, right? Place where he could sleep, that sort of thing. But the thing about caravels that was different than galley ships was that right here on the deck, okay, on the deck, is actually where people would sleep. So that was a really interesting thing about the caravel, um, is that, you know, it wasn't the most comfortable. There weren't these private quarters. No, people were just sort of out on the deck. Uh, and so it, I can't imagine it was a very comfortable journey. Uh, but nevertheless, Henry the Navigator, uh, the Prince of Portugal, he sort of initiated, and his nation, Portugal, they sort of initiated this new boat. And uh, you, we would even see that uh, Ferdinand and Isabella would sort of, uh, whenever they began to uh, finance different trips, the age of exploration, and even thinking back about the specific exploration that we know about uh, with Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue in 1492, uh, he would actually have two of his ships be caravels. The, uh, I believe it was the Nina and the Pinta, but I can't remember exactly, but I know that two of his ships were caravels. I think the other one was a galley. I'm not entirely sure about that, but nevertheless, it does show you that this caravel was very important uh, for the age of exploration inspiration and for uh, the explorers as they went to different places. Okay, now let's keep talking about caravels just a little bit, okay? We can see a couple different items here, the forecastle, the rudder, the tiller, the stern castle, the capstan, all these different things. I, essentially, I, I, this, isn't a, this isn't a lesson about boats, but I, but I do want you to recognize that all of these things that uh, were really built, right, for the uh, caravel, they were all built for the idea of speed, okay? They were all built for speed and sort of a quickness, but also maneuverability, okay? So speed was sort of key uh, when it came to these, right? Here's another example of that. Remember I said there's not too many places that you can actually go inside of the boat because it was a, a, a flat boat. Uh, and then underneath the boat down in here would be a place where you could actually store different things and whatnot. Okay, so that gives you just a little bit of idea. And then also here is a here's a galley. Now you can see that the galley, right, is much larger, right? And even in here, you're talking there might even be one or even two different 
floors uh, in this ship. It's much larger. And the other thing that you notice as well, right, if you look at these, there are lots of different oars. It almost seems like it's man-powered, right? Where it's like an oar where people are actually paddling, almost similar to those Viking longships, but instead of it being a longship, it's more of a very stout ship, right? Um, and so these were a little bit slower than the, than the Caravels, and so that's why they made sort of that switch. Okay, now, let's talk a little bit about Henry the Navigator, okay? Henry the Navigator. Now remember, he is Portuguese, okay? So he is a prince in Portugal, and he really wants to explore, okay? That's sort of his, his thing. He really wants to explore, you know, but Portugal was a small kingdom, not much wider than the state of Florida, actually. It had long coasts with many beaches and harbors. It had all sorts of wild animals, and the Portuguese were actually known in many ways for growing just beautiful resources of grapes and olives, and things like that. And uh, because Portugal had such a long coastline, it was actually very easy for the Portuguese, pe Portuguese people to build boats and to sail on them or to sail them and, and to go from different places. And, um, and so Henry actually said, you know what, I want to use these boats, uh, not just for short trips, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to just go on a short trip to a couple of different islands or whatever. I want to go explore land. So he was sort of one of the very first uh, long journey explorers, okay? One of the very first uh, long journey uh, explorers, okay? And Henry first sort of began to think about building a fleet of, of seagoing ships, and he was like, how can I build a ship that, that would really work on the sea? And uh, they actually came up with this, this new ship, the, the, the Caravel. And uh, the, the thing that you need to know about Henry is he actually created a school for navigation. Okay, created a school for navigation. And that's why he is such an important character is because he's one of the reasons why people, in many ways, were learning how to navigate, even on long distance journeys. And uh, it's actually Henry and many of the other explorers that would begin, and here's another picture of Henry the Navigator, right? He in his super cool hat, right? I love that hat. It definitely shows like, oh man, I'm ready to explore the world, right? <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about Henry the Navigator and, and even his companions and even other explorers and what, what was so important about them. Well, really what they were doing is they were doing something that was totally new, totally fresh. Uh, now, you know that, um, especially back in the Middle Ages, there were a many, 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 many people who believed that the earth was flat. Not too many people believed that the earth was round. But not, even, not only that, uh, not only did people view the earth as flat, but they also also weren't sure that there were multiple different continents. You know, they didn't have that, you know, something that they could shoot up into space to take pictures back of the Earth so they could see what the Earth would look like. And so it actually took a long time for people to recognize that the Earth was round. And not only that, that there wasn't just one big continent uh, because they couldn't explore whatever. They were pretty sure, yeah, there are different continents and things like that, different parts of land, but they weren't sure how spaced out they were. And so this is really, really key because Henry the Navigator and even all the other explorers that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks towards the end of our school year, they were all cartographers. Okay, and a cartographer is somebody who creates and builds maps, well not, not builds, but draws and drafts maps according to what they're exploring. And so exploration was huge because it was going to grow the knowledge of uh, those who wanted to know more about the world that they were living in. And so this is sort of the idea behind navigation. Okay, if you're going to navigate now, you guys have probably heard of navigation machines or something like that. I remember the first time that a, a navigation uh, like GPS came out. I remember when I was a, a, a young kid, those GPSs came out and, you know, you could take it and go anywhere. Right. Whereas before you could do that because remember there was a day when iPhones didn't exist. And so you didn't have just Google Maps. You could find out what, where to go or whatever. And I remember how important that was because the navigation, right, it helped you when you're navigating, you're trying to find a certain destination. 
And maps help you do that, right? Maps help you do that. And so one of the beautiful things about Henry the Navigator and many of the explorers that uh, would later come after him, you know, Christopher Columbus and, uh, you know, uh, even uh, Cortez and Magellan and Vasco da Gama, all these people that we're going to talk about, they really focused on maps, right? Making sure that they were doing their best to improve our maps. Now, this map in particular that I that we are currently looking at right now is a very interesting map. Uh, this was a map um, from about 1450, that's right. This particular map is from about 1450. And I, I just want you to think about, well, what are some things that you're noticing about this map? Like, can you actually figure out what you're looking at? Um, well, this is actually uh, Western Europe, Western Europe. <laughs> That's right. And it probably looks a little bit different than the Western Europe that you and I have drawn together. Um, and there certainly must have been some progress, right, in between this particular map and then in 1492 when, when Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, but this is sort of a better idea of, of these uh, you know, Europe and, and even part of Africa's West Coast, those sorts of things as a result of Henry the Navigator who would later go there. But I want you to think about this particular map. Okay, this is called the Fraum, uh, Fraumaro map, I think is how you say it. Um, I, I could be totally messing that up. But nevertheless, this, sorts of, this sort of map is beginning to get a little spherical, right? You can look here that there's even this focus of a spherical world that we live on, okay? And uh, you can even see here that there's even an idea of the Earth's core, right? The very middle, right? That there's different layers in the Earth, which is interesting. But I think the really important thing that you need to focus on in this particular lesson, uh, in, 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 or excuse me, about cartography and, and, and map making and things like that, is that you can tell that the Earth is not automatically or directly north to south like a straight line right? Because the earth spins on an axis, okay? Which I think is really, really interesting because whenever we start talking about a little something called a compass, right? That is really, really, really helpful uh, for us. And let me redo that. Okay. Compass, Right? We've got to remember that the Earth does not just go vertical north to south. It, I mean, it does, but it doesn't, right? Because it's spinning on an axis. So here's what you need to know about the compass that I thought was so in interesting. Okay, a compass, okay, is an instrument with a magnetic, magnetic needle. Okay, so it has this mag magnetic needle in it, okay, uh, that always points north. Okay, it always points north. Now, there is something called like a north, something like north magnetic or like a north magnet, like a north pole magnet and a south pole magnet basically that the earth um, sort of operates on, right? So we've got this magnet sort of, I mean, imagine this, right? I, it's, it's more science than your teacher i.e. me, it knows how to teach you, but uh, that there's a magnet in the North Pole and there's a magnet in the South Pole, basically. Um, and that's sort of when we get this sort of idea of magnetic energy and those sorts of things. But a compass, basically, there is a magnet that basically is attracted to that North Pole magnet. So that when we're talking about North, right, it's showing us towards that magnet. Now, here's the deal, though. When you and I draw a compass on, you know, on paper, right, we just are working with a flat surface. So when we're talking about north, our map on a flat, on a flat, or, or sorry, our compass on a flat piece of paper like this, right, if I said north, south, right, and then east and west, this north right here is called true north, Okay, true north, all right? Whereas our Earth oftentimes might be like this, where it's north, south, east, west, right? So your compass isn't always directly pointing you straight north, right? But it is directing you north, okay? So just keep that in mind for a compass, but I thought that was a very interesting uh, and a very interesting part, okay? All right, now the other thing that I want to tell you about is something called an astrolabe. Okay, 
astrolabe. Okay, and this astrolabe is a special measuring tool. Well, what does it measure? Well, it measures how far the sun or the North Star lay above the horizon. So it measures how far, how far the sun or North Star lay above the horizon. Now, you might be like, Mr. Goodwin, why do I need to know this? Well, he here's why, okay? Because ultimately, this is how they'd be able to calculate a ship's position from this information. Like, where is it, right? They would be able to use this astrolabe to do that, right? It's a very cool figure, right? You definitely would know how to need to know how to use it, but it basically helps them position the ship on where it is in the globe. Now, this is all... Henry the Navigator, in many ways, he's the one that develops many of these different things, right? Like better maps, right? A better astrolabe, a better compass, that sort of thing. Uh, and so it's really Henry the Navigator that helps us see, all right, what exactly we're working with, which I think is really, really tremendous. But the thing that I wanted to note, note with you, right? And, and Henry the Navigator, he decides that he's going to travel, okay? Uh, once Henry sailors uh, learned how to navigate through unfamiliar waters, they were basically they're ready to head to South Africa, south down to Africa. They really wanted to go to Africa, but nobody had ever been before. Uh, no one had ever sailed down to the coast of Africa, right? So he decides, you know what, I'm going to do this, right? This area that they went to go sail, right, using all these different materials that I show you, was called the Sea of Darkness. Ooh, intense. Why is it such an intense name? Well, because they actually believed that there were sea monsters. Oh, man. There were sea monsters <coughs> and whirlpools. Basically, that they might not ever return, right? And so, uh, I mean, you know, we even talked about the Sea of Darkness in, uh, in oh, what was it? Uh, Dr. Doolittle, do you remember that? Dr. Doolittle, which I thought was really, really cool. So we think about, uh, you know, they, they ultimately thought that the Sea of Darkness was a very scary place. They were afraid of the ocean because sometimes it would become so shallow and, and, and ships would wreck on the bottom, which was so important for these new ships that Henry the Navigator had, had, had bought and, and, and made. Um, and they even thought, which is crazy, uh, they even thought that the sun down south was so hot that the seawater would boil and roast them alive. Uh, and in many, in, in many cases, there were actually people who believed that if you went too far south, that the world was actually upside down, which was very an interesting belief as well. But nevertheless, okay, Henry the Navigator, he sails down to Africa, and we'll learn more about that next week. But I do want you to just be thinking about these different uh, things that were very, very helpful, these different items that Henry the Navigator helped develop, that he helped make better, ultimately for the case of Age of Exploration. Now, you might be wondering, why did I talk a little bit about uh, Ferdinand and Isabella at the beginning of this particular lesson? And the reason why I did talk about Ferdinand and Isabella is because these two individuals would be so key in financing different explorers as they began to explore the globe. And so we're going to talk a lot, a lot about Ferdinand and Isabella and their money. That's right. We're going to talk a lot about their money. So get ready to talk about money, money, money. All right. With that said, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. See you later.